There's a quote I read not long ago that I think is fitting for some of the maelstrom in which we find ourselves as a culture. This is from Ron Rusher. Life has become a maelstrom in which speed and accomplishment, consumption and productivity have become the most valued of human commodities. In this rush of our work, we take everything for granted. What else can we do? We consume things, people, and information. We do not have time to savor this life, nor to care deeply and gently for our loved ones, ourselves, or our world. Rather, with increasingly dizzying haste, we use them up and throw them away and move on. I say that because if that's the kind of emotional culture in which you find yourself, and that infection, which I really believe it is, begins to get inside the human heart, it produces two things. One, it produces a kind of anger, uh, often unfocused, but still present, because I know I'm caught in a way of life for which I am emotionally and physically ill-suited, and yet, the stress and demanded of it all, sort of like being on the rapids, pushes me anyway. I feel like <coughs> in some ways, because of all of the demands that are only increasing, I have no choice but to give in to all of that pressure. The second thing that happens is I live with that kind of pressure and the kind of sort of generalized anger that it produces. I begin to look at life, particularly at what I'm not having as both unfair and especially if it's coupled with, but I in fact have the right to have it. In other words, a part of what happens is literally the politiz politicalization of my unmet needs. After all, we are guaranteed life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm not feeling very much alive. I'm feeling bound by what I'm not getting, and therefore I'm extremely unhappy. I want my rights as a citizen of the United States of America. You don't see any of that in the Syrophoenician woman. None. And yet, she is in fact living in a racially prejudicial situation. She was less than the Israelis. When Jesus quotes, it's not right to take the food that belongs to the children and give it to the dogs. He was literally quoting the pervasive attitude of how Jews at the time saw goyim, which means dog. And yet, look how she responds. She did not say, I'm no less than anybody else. I have just as much of a right to approach you even in obeisance, which is what I did, if you will notice. She doesn't say that at all. In fact, her reply is, is not just clever, though it is. It's very clever, in fact. What comes through, actually, is this extraordinary combination of standing on the one hand. She doesn't give an inch. And yet, in the light as well, and not in contradiction to, extraordinary humility. It is, in fact, before God, a winning combination. Because you see, the, the temptation for us is literally to fall on one side or the other. To, to stand in anger, it's my right and why aren't you listening, O oh God? And there's sure biblical precedent for that in the Psalms, but I'm not sure that wins his favors. Uh, or, on the one hand, to fall off the other side and to say, I don't deserve anything, so I'm surely not going to ask. Why should I waste my time and God's time on something when he's trying to deal with world peace for crying out loud? <laughs> she falls on neither side of the fence. She continues to stand and speaks out of an extraordinary faith and humility that is really, in the whole Gospel of Mark, pretty dazzling. In fact, Mark places the story in a very particular place in his narrative. 
Just prior to that, he's been wrestling with the Pharisees about clean and unclean. And so in some ways, the story of the Syrophoenician is actually an illustration of the principle that Jesus lays out about, it's not what happens outwardly that makes one unclean, it's what's in the heart. Look at this Syrophoenician woman, as Mark is saying. She's in a better place when it comes to faith than either the disciples or the Pharisees. And therefore, she is in fact laid out as an extraordinary model of faith. I want to hold the story up that way rather than sort of indicating, as some people do, that you know, Jesus is just being a human irritant at that point. He doesn't like the fact that this Gentile is breaking in on what he's trying to do. That's, that's actually entirely inconsistent with his character. So, what does that have to say for us? Well, several things. Any of us can be liable to that same kind of generalized anger because we don't like the pressures that are on us. And in fact, what it should be causing us to do is to cry out to God for a reordering of our life. Certainly, we who say we serve God even more, even before we serve the diocese or anything else, do have a responsibility before God to ask God to order the details of our life in a way that really does make room for rest and peace. Secondly, it's to know that God is the one before whom we stand should bring us comfort in knowing before whom we do stand, that we can, in fact, stand in his presence. And that, that he does not reject that. He, in fact, welcomes it. We do have a God who, in fact, pays attention to all of who we are, both good and bad, and welcomes us into his presence. Notice, even before the Syrophoenician, he did not say no. Instead, he offered an invitation in the derogatory adage that he quoted. Same for us. There are lots of reasons God could say no to any of us, quite frankly, if it's all about how well we are, <laughs> what we're doing, the caliber of sin versus virtue in our lives. And yet he never says that. Never, in fact. And therefore, we can come to him and stand in faith. Not in the demanding of our rights, but in knowing that that posture is welcome before God. And that he does hear us every single time we speak. Amen. Amen.